Good evening, everyone. Welcome to Local Matters. It's a special forum hosted by the LA Times and KPCC LAist to share the wisdom about that constant in all of our lives, earthquakes, and how to survive a major shaker. I'm Pat Morrison, the Times columnist and part of the team that's been working on a recent LA Times project called Unshaken on earthquake readiness and resilience for this part of the world that in the 1970s, the truckers called shaky town. We have all kinds of experts here for you and your questions. We'll be debunk debunking some myths and putting in your hands the information that you can use to protect yourselves when there is a whole lot of shaking going on. I'm joined by Austin Cross, host of NPR affiliate KPCC's All Things Considered and the Consider This podcast. So let's get this party started, Austin. Thank you so much, Pat. If you have lived in Southern California since, you know, uh, yesterday, you know we live in earthquake country. The little shakeups that we feel every now and then remind us of that reality. And yet, because the threat of a severe earthquake has loomed for so long in many of our lives, it's sometimes easy to lose sight of how quickly our lives can be turned upside down. Like many of you here tonight, I'll never forget days like January 17th, 1994. The rumbling, the swaying, the uncertainty, and lots and lots of broken glass. But the reality is that the so-called big one that you'll hear about tonight could be far more devastating than that. It's a subject KPCC and LAist have explored in depth in the acclaimed podcast titled The Big One, hosted by our science reporter, Jacob Margolis. And it is what we'll dig into tonight with reporters, as well as the undisputed MVP in earthquake preparedness here. We will highlight the dangers of a major earthquake and help you make a plan for how you can keep your family safe. Now, to understand the present and future, a little history lesson is necessary. And for that, I want to go back to Pat Morrison because, Pat, you've covered your share of earthquakes in your career. Well, I think, Jake, uh, that uh, anybody who has been here long enough as a reporter, Austin, ends up covering earthquakes. And contrary to mythology, I was not here for the 1857 Fort Tejon uh, quake, which was just about rivaling the one in San Francisco nearly 50 years later in size, about 7.9, a massive earthquake. Of course, there weren't many people living here then, but the aftershocks went on for almost four years, and a great deal of damage was done in spite of the fact that there wasn't much left to do damage to. But in 1950, 1987, I was covering the visit of the King of Spain to Southern California when the Whittier Narrows quake hit. That was about a 5.9. The King was staying in a hotel, and he assured one of his aides that, well, the hotel was built to a 7.0 standard, so everything was going to be fine. But when the hotel did the bend and snap, I was told that the king also responded with, shall we say, a curt English expletive. So that's the oh king of Spain here in Southern California. But with every earthquake, we learn new lessons, like the deadly Long Beach earthquake in 1933 really changed a lot of policies, building policies and attitudes in Southern California. And those changes saved thousands of lives. And there were actually picture postcards published about this. I think we have some to show you. Uh, up on the screen here from my collection, the 1933 Long Beach earthquake. Can you imagine sort of a chamber of commerce? Hey, look, here's our earthquake. Um, but it may also have changed people's minds about moving to Southern California, a topic I think we'll be talking about later as well. And here's one from the 1994 earthquake that you mentioned, Austin, also an attitude altering quake and a policy altering quake. It's also the earthquake that introduced many of you in Southern California to our next guest, at least virtually by television and radio. She's the author of The Big Ones, How Natural Disasters Have Shaped Us and What We Can Do About Them. She is a fourth generation Californian. Her her great great grandparents, I love this bit, are buried near the San Andreas Fault, and she is one terrific viola da gamba player. So, welcome the renowned seismologist, Dr. Lucy Jones. Thanks for having me here today. Dr. Lucy Jones, it is so good to have you here. And for nearly three decades, you've been on speed dial for SoCal reporters when the earth starts to shake. And I just want to start off by asking how do you think you became? the face and voice of both warning and of calm for so many Southern Californians? Well, it's a funny thing because in, in fact, of course, many of the seismologists, all of us have it as part of our job to do this response. And it was actually the Whittier Narrows earthquake that Pat was talking about was the very first time that I was 
on TV with an earthquake. Um, but I think I would, I've been able to recognize something, which is that people come to us for information, but it's not because of really their curiosity, it's because of their fear. And our information is actually uh, a way to reduce your fear when you're faced with, with you know, the, the sudden out of the blue earthquake that, that scares you. And so the degree to which we can provide the information in a way that reassures people that shows them that we understand what's going on, uh, rather than highlighting our scientific curiosity and looking at what we don't know about the earthquake. Uh, and it's helped people adjust, I think. Yeah, and, you know, having worked. In, oh, sorry, Pat Morrison. Oh, no, please. go ahead, Austin, please. <laughs> oh, I know, having from uh, worked in journalism all these years, that sometimes fear can add an extra layer of complication to any situation, especially a, a disaster. Well, right. We don't. We make decisions for different reasons when we're dealing with fear, and much about earthquakes trigger very primal attitudes. Like it's the th predator we can't see that's the more dangerous. So the fact that you can't see the earthquake coming, the fact that it's not predicted, is part of what makes it scary. And when you're facing that situation, what we have is you know people don't believe us that we can't predict it. There is. You know, I still remember getting a, a letter from someone who said, I know you, you can't tell me when the next earthquake's going to be, but will you tell me when you go to visit your out-of-town relative, when your children go to visit their out-of-town relatives? No, not that I couldn't tell them, but that I wouldn't, and that somehow they could figure that out by, by seeing me show up. So it's, uh, um, it's not just science that we're trying to communicate at this time. Can I ask if it's okay with you, Austin, if I can pop in, how how are you fighting against the way earthquakes are portrayed in pop culture? One of the best things I think you ever did was live tweeting during that, I can't re remember the name of some recent earthquake movie, where no matter how many helicopters the, st the star of the movie had, your tweets would save thousands more lives. <laughs> well, thank you. That was actually San Andreas. And, thank you. Uh, one of the things I should have tweeted is, like, you really think if an L.A. fireman stole the helicopter to go rescue his own family, he'd still have a job when he got back? Right? Um, there were a lot of things that were needed. It's one of the biggest problems, you know, and I think there's a feeling, oh, everyone knows those are just movies. That's not real. But I've had an elected official, a high-level elected official, ask me when that earthquake that's going to form the chasm like they had in that movie, when is that one going to happen? and trying to explain that, in fact, we don't form chasms, that if the Earth could open up, you wouldn't have an earthquake because there wouldn't be any friction. Um, so I, 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 I would hope that Hollywood would recognize that people take them seriously, even if they don't take themselves seriously. And it's always the scientist in the white coat who issues the warnings that nobody pays any attention to. Yes, we should be accustomed to not being listened to. I mean, I have to admit, if I, I think if I were to go to Mayor Garcetti or somebody else and say, you know, I really do think an earthquake's coming. I'm afraid I'd be listened to all too well. And since I'd never be certain about that, <laughs> you know, you really, the, the good news is, is there's really nothing, the good news for me, there's nothing that we can see that tells us that an earthquake's coming. So I really don't have to worry about facing that situation. Preparation is such a big part, Dr. Jones. And I think people need to understand this is a lifestyle thing for you. There's this famous picture I found while researching for this conversation, uh, and you're holding your sleeping child while talking to the press. I'm sure you know which picture I'm talking about. Yes. And I also understand that you used to have essentially was it earthquake drills with your children when you were when they were growing up. Oh yeah, because they need to know what to do, and you you know you don't think in those times of scariness. So yes, we would have the earthquake game. And anybody in the family could say earthquake, and we all had to pretend one was happening and, and go under the table, do our drop cover, hold on. I, I did have to put limits on it because they found making mommy jump under the table was way too much fun. <laughs> and it tended to be played a little bit too often. But that's a long time back. That little baby has a baby of his own now. Wow. I want to look at where we are now, Dr. Jones, but right off the top, I think it's important to establish how we know that the big one is on the way. And obviously the San Andreas Fault will be the star of much of this conversation, but it's research by geologist Carrie C that helped us realize that a major quake is past due. Can you maybe give us the, the pamphlet version of what he discovered? Okay, yeah, Carrie was fundamental to what we do here. You know, 
we have a history of earthquakes. There was one in 1857, but we don't have written records before like 1760. And, and so when was the one before that? We don't know. Kerry came up with the idea of literally digging into the fault and looking at the geology along the fault, you know, like the top 10 feet of the ground, dig a 10 foot deep trench and see where things had been moved. So the San Andreas fault is a strike slip fault. That means one side is moving sideways compared to the other and features in the ground get carried along with it. After one earthquake breaks it like that, more sediment gets put in place and then another earthquake breaks it again. And if we can time the time of the, uh, the sediments that were broken and the sediments that were not broken, we know that the earthquake had to have been in between that. It became called paleoseismology. Kerry created it for his PhD thesis. He got a professorship at Caltech on the basis of it and has proceeded to train um, many other scientists that continue to do that. So there we can get the history of the fault. The San Andreas right. is there. It, it's, you know, we aren't stopping plate tectonics. And when you dig in, like in the last 10 earthquakes, they've averaged about 100 years apart. And, you know, some, but some of them are less than 50 years apart. One of them's more than 300 years apart. So we know the earthquake is absolutely inevitable. On average, once every 100 years, every year has a 1% chance. But the time since the last earthquake doesn't matter very much. So the fact that it's been 160 years up in the northern part of the fault or, you know, 300 years down in the southern part of the fault, we still have about a 1% chance per year of having that earthquake. Because if, if I can jump in, Austin, the general feeling is that if there's an earthquake somewhere, it relieves the pressure for all of us. The little earthquake, for example, on the west side, I think it was yesterday, and we all feel a little better. But it doesn't work that way exactly. It doesn't. One of the, the most consistent feature of earthquakes is what's called the B value, which means that for every earthquake of some size, they say for every magnitude 7, we will have 10 magnitude 6s and 100 magnitude 5s and 1,000 magnitude 4s and 10,000 magnitude 3s. So those 7s don't happen very often, but every time we get a 3, we're accumulating that number, and at some point we've got to have that 7 to balance out that ratio because that is the constant of earthquakes. And so, so it's that worse. Needs a... <laughs> it's yeah. worse, yeah. yes, actually. Um, my, I like to put it that when you have a lot of earthquakes, you tend to have a lot of earthquakes. Well, and so that leads us to now, actually, because fresh on the heels of one other major disaster, many of us maybe might have a little bit more headspace to think about the faults that are locked and loaded all around us. Uh, what do you think we've been neglecting, Dr. Jones, uh, as a region while our attention has been focused on COVID-19? Well, right. COVID-19 really, you know, th that's a disaster bigger than what the earthquake's going to do. More Southern Californians died from the pandemic than will die for the earthquake. I think we need to remember that. It doesn't feel like it because the earthquake is very sudden. But if we really look at what we're dealing with, think about how existing inequalities, existing trouble in our economic systems were exacerbated by the pandemic. And I think the big lesson that we should take from this is that our systems, whether they're physical systems or human systems, fail where they are already weak. And if we have a struggling economy and then hit it with the earthquake, we're gonna be a lot more, uh, suffer a lot more than if we have the resources to rebuild. So when you think about getting ready for the earthquake, it's not just have a kid, it really is, do you have a community that's working together? Well, now for a look at where we stand on major quake issues, I'm going to pass it back to Pat Morrison. Oh, thank you, Austin. And we're going to bring in two more guests here. One of them is Ron Lynn. The other is Jacob Margolis. Ron is the LA Times earthquake reporter who joins us from an insecure, undisclosed location in Southern California, Northern California, given what we were just talking about. And uh, of course, Jacob is KPCC's a science reporter. Can we see both of those guys and bring them on screen? There they are. Well, actually, it looks like Jacob, who's in the undisclosed location there. We can, uh, and there you are, Ron, too. So thank you both guys for joining us. And, and what we were talking about is where we stand on some of these major quake issues. If we were to have 
a report card or a checklist. We have the Olympics coming up in Los Angeles in 2028. Homelessness is looking us in the face every day. We are just starting to recover from the pandemic that Austin was talking about. But earthquake preparation, it's easy to put to the side with these immediate issues confronting us. So, so let's talk about where we stand, say, well, maybe we can start with skyscraper retrofitting, because I think that we've, we talk in our LA Times special section about how single family homes generally tend to be more secure than especially a lot of older, bigger buildings. But Jacob, maybe you can walk us through metaphorically one of those buildings and the ideas of what we're doing as a city to help look to prevention and safety. Yeah, you know, thanks for having me. I mean, one of the issues we took a look at in the Big One podcast is that of buildings that were constructed with these certain types of welds that connect all the big beams that make up the skeleton of the building. And it turns out they might not stand up to substantial ground motions when an earthquake hits. So when Northridge struck, there were a number of buildings across the region that were discovered to have cracks in these certain specific welds that have been used for decades. Um, for instance, I believe there was some damage at the Getty Center while it was being constructed at the time. The fear is that when the ground moves, it's theoretically possible that enough of these welds could crack and a building could potentially collapse. Now, which buildings are at risk, right? That's what you want to know. Well, we identified two buildings in downtown LA at City National Plaza that are known to have those welds that could potentially be in danger. It's really hard to say. I mean, these are skyscrapers. So imagine earthquake hits, found out that the welds in these buildings aren't looking great. They say like uh, maybe they need to be gone and done a lot of construction on. I mean, just the psychological impact, the financial toll of either having to take them down or go in and fix them, that'd be huge in and of itself. I mean, I know I'd be a little iffy about going into some of these big buildings if, if, if that happened after a big quake. Now, the odds of that happening, I think, are relatively small. Uh, that said, when we asked our study about it at the time when we were reporting out the podcast, I asked him, like, is this on your radar? And he was like, no, there are bigger issues. Uh, like the vulnerability of certain apartment buildings that could very well collapse, as Ron has reported on a ton. Um, and we've actually seen those collapse before in Northridge. And there are a number of them still out there that haven't been retrofitted. So, you know, we have these big literal structural problems that will not be fixed or are being you know, some people are working on it. Uh, it's not going to be fixed probably until something bad enough happens that there's either the political will, financial will, what have you, yeah. to really to really make a big move. And the apartment buildings have seen that a bit, and I'm, I'm sure Ron has would have a lot to say about that as well. Let, before I go to Ron, I want to ask you, though, Jacob, are these welds, for example, are these failings that we are only now capable of knowing because of technology? No. Or are these a lot of problems that, that were allowed to go up or existed even in spite of codes that may have said, uh, not so fast? Uh, I mean, we figured it out in 1994. So we've known for some time and they, they changed the standard after that. Uh, and, but there were, the issues are still out there and we know it could very well be an issue when, you know, big enough quake hits. I mean, it's pretty much as simple as that. And, and Ron, when we talk about apartment buildings, you're going to have so many more thousands of people in apartment buildings than you might have in a couple of downtown office buildings, depending on what time a, a quake may hit. What did you find about the construction and the vulnerabilities? Yeah, so this is something that has been known for, for quite a while. And, and we actually found out a lot about it during the, the Northridge earthquake in which um, uh, we just one, uh, there was one catastrophic collapse of, of what's known as a soft story apartment building. So you, you've seen this. These are building apartment buildings where the ground floor is held up by these skinny poles. You know, this usually, is where uh, I learned the, the word dingbat to describe exactly. these apartment buildings. <laughs> Exactly. And, and they're, they're, they're held up by these skinny poles. And when the shaking comes, you know, those poles can collapse and that ground floor can, can turn into rubble. And unfortunately, in this one apartment complex, um, there were also apartments on that ground floor and 16 people died uh, in, that, um, in that tragedy. Now, it wasn't just, there are, you know, thousands of these apartments uh, around uh, California. Um, in, in the 94 Northridge earthquake alone, 200 of these apartment buildings um, were severely damaged or destroyed. I mean, think about how many uh, homes, how many people were, went uh, homeless as a result of that, and how, and for the landlords, the, the economic ruin uh, they may 
they may have faced as a result of that. Um, I mean, fortunately, there are, uh, you know, with uh, with a lot of attention, including um, efforts by uh, Lucy Jones and uh, Mayor Garcetti to to raise awareness of, about this issue. Uh, the city of LA uh, uh, has required uh, that these these kinds of so-called soft story buildings be retrofitted. So, so that that's that's a that's a good sign. Uh, some other cities have made efforts to to, to do the same thing, including uh, places like uh, Santa Monica. Um, however, there are a lot of other suburbs around Southern California that haven't. And so those are some cities to keep an eye on uh, when the next big quake happens. And Ron, I think I also read about cities that have rolled back their seismic requirements because they got lobbied, frankly, by people who said it's too expensive. Yeah, I mean, that that's an unfortunate thing. One of the things that is... Uh, 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 something that we've known for almost 100 years are brick buildings or stone buildings, brick buildings that were built before people in Southern California, you know, really knew that earthquakes were a big thing uh, in the state. And, you know, when they're not, uh, when there's not, you know, when they're not reinforced with steel, basically, they, uh, they can come down. The, basically, the sides of the, the walls can start peeling outward and they collapse. And, they are, you know, the the de one of the deadliest types of buildings um, uh, out there. And you know, one of the things that we found, uh, you know, we went out to the the the. So in Los Angeles, Los Angeles, you know, back in the late '70s or early '80s, they said, you know what, we're going to require that these buildings be retrofitted or demolished. And that's been a big successful effort. Uh, not a single person in the 94 Northridge earthquake died as a result of these brick buildings collapsing. But one of the, 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 the areas that I'm most concerned about is the Inland Empire. We're talking about San Bernardino and Riverside counties. And many of the cities there have not uh, required these buildings to be retrofitted or demolished. There are, you know, oftentimes there's the, the argument that, well, you know, the owners can't afford to do it. Uh, but that's setting up these cities for a major economic catastrophe when uh, the big earthquake happens. Uh, many people might not realize that you know a big earthquake has not really hit the San Bernardino or Riverside County areas in historic time, and so so those brick buildings are ripe to come down, and there could be a lot of uh, death and economic devastation if nothing is done about those buildings. And we also seem to repeat our mistakes again and again, just as we still build in high, high fire prone zones, we're still building on earthquake faults. Yeah, I mean, that is something that you really don't want to do. And so there, there's, there's a project going on right now. It's been going on for, for, more, than a, for more than a decade now. It's, it's called the Hollywood Center Project. And, and the developer is proposing these skyscrapers of 46 and 35 stories tall. And alongside it are these senior low-income towers for senior residents that would each stand 11 stories tall. The problem is, you know, if you talk to the scientists at the California Geological Survey, this is the state agency that's the gold standard scientific authority on where faults are in California. They're saying, you know what, the, the Hollywood fault runs directly underneath the site. And you know the site. I mean, this is the site of, you know, right alongside the, um, the Capitol Records uh, building near Hollywood and Vine. Uh, the developer has disputed this, and the city has ordered a trench to be dug at the site to really figure out what's going on. But you can see why this would be a big concern. Imagine putting a uh, an entire foundation uh, of a skyscraper on both sides of a fault. That means when that fault goes, one side of the foundation is going to go one way, and one side of the foundation is going to go the other way. And that's going to set up a recipe for a catastrophic collapse of a skyscraper that no one wants to see. Uh, Lucy, that does sound like a cinematic effect. Well, it's also illegal. I mean, that we do have a law in the state of California called the Aquas Priello Act that you're not allowed to build a high, you know, multi-story building on an active fault. Um, the problem comes in of how do you define exactly where the active fault is. But as Ron said, the California Geological Survey are the experts. They're the implementers of the law. Um, but the way it's set up, it ends up being the local building department's decision as to whether to to, have, to do this, which to me is a surprise. I think it's pretty straightforward when CGS says there's a fault here, there, there's a fault there. And, you know, go look at the, <laughs> the Capitol Records building. You notice how the road goes like this, right where it is? That's the fault scar. 
Hmm. In some previous uh, earthquake, one side moved up compared to the other. In a and couple of minutes, again. <laughs> in a couple of minutes, Austin and I will talk to Lucy about mental health issues. Certainly, something we've grappled <laughs> with with the pandemic. But right now, I would like to ask Jacob. We hear in other countries that have early warning systems for earthquakes. And as, as Lucy was saying, people expect there to be early warning systems, maybe because they've seen it in the movies. Is, is California, is Southern California in particular, lagging behind some of the technology and the systems that could help us out here? I mean, maybe Lucy and Ron feel a little bit different than I do about this, but I, I think we're doing a pretty good job. Like, and so to explain to people what these are, basically there's a bunch of sensors that have been installed in the ground all across the state. And when, say, the San Andreas Fault slips, the, at the like, very, very, very beginning of the earthquake, these sensors basically pick up the waves and faster than the waves can travel through the earth, hopefully, you know, uh, it transmits to us here in LA or in other areas, like a heads up that something's coming. And, you know, that can have a huge benefit. You could get under your desk, uh, you could pull over to the side of the road. I mean, if it was, the part that would be great is if it was even more integrated into society. So maybe, I don't know how this exactly would work, but uh, maybe surgeries would stop, trains would slow down, which I know we do see in other countries, um, just that, so that everybody could prepare and be alerted that when a massive shaking is about to start. So these alerts do come through the cell network as well. So I don't know, maybe if we're, you know, I shouldn't say this, but uh, we're having a really bad fire season ahead. Maybe there's some power shutoffs going on, the cell network's down for one reason or another, and uh, then we don't get a heads up, and that would be bad. And I don't really have a solution for that. Um, but, you know, I don't think that's usually the case. Can I yeah. offer, I mean, I think technically we're doing it. I, it's the seismic network that I worked on for all those years at the USGS and Caltech. It's the same thing that tells us there's an earthquake at all, and we're just doing it so much more quickly. I think our biggest problem is in the implementation of it is the distribution of the information to the end users. Now, Jacob talked about going through the cell system. Well, that can add many seconds of delay, and you're now getting the message after the earthquake's already begun. And I think we've also fallen back a bit on how we really educate people about how to receive the information. So um, we sort of, the scientists have done their part. I feel like we really need to work at that social implementation part a little more carefully to make sure that people can get the information. We do it most efficiently. And, uh, and as Jake was saying, integrating it into, you know, set up so there are alarms in the operating room. We could be doing that right now with a simple installation of an alarm in an operating room. Ideally, uh, Dr. And, Jones, and, uh, sorry to interrupt there, Pat. No, go ahead, Austin. Uh, ideally, Dr. Jones, how many seconds would people get uh, before? You don't uh, get to ask that question. It depends upon, <laughs> damn, right? How many seconds is there between the lightning and the thunder? It depends on how far away you are, right? So the farther away you are, the more time you get and the less likely you are to have a big impact. Mm -hmm. So mostly if you're close enough to really have a lot of damage, you get a very small amount of time and the most efficient use of this is an automatic system. You know, an automatic system that uh, shuts down the handling of toxic materials could make a huge difference with just a second or two. The farther away you are, the more time you get, the one exception is the biggest earthquakes are big because they're on a long fault. So you could be having, uh, be right on top of the magnitude seven and a half and potentially have a minute warning that there's an earthquake on the San Andreas. What you don't know is whether it's gonna grow to be the one that comes through your place. So it, it's, it, the, it's one of those, it's like a Heisenberg's uncertainty principle. The closer you are, the less time you get, uh, the more, the less time, you, uh, the more time you get, the more accurate it is, or the, no, the longer it takes, the more <laughs> accurate it is. So, you know, it's likely that we'll have a message, an earthquake on the San Andreas, that's a six, because in three seconds, all you've got is a six. To be a seven, it has to go on for 30 seconds. So maybe 30 seconds later, you get a message, this earthquake's grown to at least seven, but maybe it's gonna keep on going for another minute, and then it's gonna be a magnitude eight and actually run under your house. And that's where some of the complexities come in. And how do you communicate that complex message? Well, before there, Austin, all, let, oh, sorry. Oh, no, I was just going before Austin talks about the big one, and I'm sure we'll bring some of that in. You, you wrote very compellingly about a, a kind of social contract, Lucy, about how part of preparedness 
is not just in your house or in your car. It's the way that you deal with your neighbors, your friends, your family, and the kind of resilience that you can create. And maybe we've seen a little of this during the pandemic too, as we have come to isolate, but have different kinds of dependencies on one another to keep ourselves mentally healthy. So talk about that aspect of a, an earthquake, which is so often overlooked. Well, I guess I think that in the pandemic, we've seen both. We've seen both people coming together and us turning on each other. And you know the, the stress of a disaster of any sort, you know, the system fails where it's already weak and where the United States has been having trouble with our big political divide and partisan you know, divide, that got worse and it got amplified and the problems became amplified because we didn't share an understanding of where we turn to for authoritative information. And so I think when we have our big earthquake, we are going to be facing huge stresses. You know, we see a rise in, in suicides after any of the major disasters. And because our building code and basically all of our regulations focus very much just on life safety, and we sort of say, if you suffer a big financial loss out of the earthquake, oh, well, that was your, that was your decision to make. And so we have buildings that probably won't collapse, but will be a total financial ruin. And then we're going to be seeing a huge number of bankruptcies. And what's the mental health challenge of that? Um, and it gets back to study after study has shown that societies, communities with a, a greater social engagement with a higher degree of what the social scientists call social capital, connections between each other. More social capital is a better outcome mentally and economically in any big disaster. So Austin, why don't you talk about some of those aspects of the big one? Sure thing, Pat. With all of that in mind, the big question here is what would happen if a major quake hit, say, tomorrow? Uh, and that's actually a scene that we try to lay out in the podcast, the big one hosted by Jacob Margolis here. So it is fitting that I should put this question first to you, Jacob. What can we expect? Yeah, we did a lot of research, um, you know, looking into this question for our podcast, uh, which is called The Big One, Your Survival Guide. And we wanted people to get a sense of what a big one could sound like mm -hmm. and what it could feel like. So let's take a minute. I would love to listen to what happens when major shaking from a massive earthquake on the San Andreas Fault hits LA. The first S wave comes in about 75 seconds after the beginning of the earthquake. That's the second wave. And you feel the ground shake harder and harder. You can't outrun it. You dive under a table and hold on. You've got about 50 seconds of very strong ground shaking. So if people try to run out of Union Station, they are likely to be thrown to the ground and break their legs, sprain their ankles, or they make it to the outside of the building as objects on the outside collapse onto them. Definitely there will be the perception that the ground is, is literally waving in front of you. That is a sobering picture you've painted for us there, Jacob. I'm just curious now, as you worked on this podcast, was it a little bit frightening for you to discover the things that you discovered? Me? Oh, oh yeah. Absolute. Lived in absolute terror the entire time. Uh, but I will say that talking to uh, Lucy, which you, who you heard, obviously, in that clip, um, we talked to her quite a bit. Uh, it, was, it was reassuring. But, you know, I'd also say that this pandemic put a lot of um, how we handle disasters like Lucy was talking about in perspective. And I think that, that for me, where I ultimately ended up was that while we are pretty good at the triage, the immediate response, a lot of the time, like we have those huge fire departments, police departments that could potentially get out there. It's really sort of up to us to be self-sufficient. And especially if you're especially if you have access and functional needs, if you have a disability, um, there are many people that are just not going to be helped by the government and need to figure it out. And so we've definitely, for my family, which luckily we have a lot of here, have, have spent a lot of time sorting out what would happen 
from what we would do. And, uh, you know, that gives me a little bit more inner peace. Uh, and I think the podcast kind of, kind of can help a lot of people potentially reach that place. But Dr. Lucy Jones and listening to Jacob's full podcast, one of the things that struck me was just how many fires could start as a result of the shaking and how even structures built to fire codes could still catch fire. How bad could it get? That was to me the biggest shock when we did the big study of the San Andreas earthquake was the fire modeling showed uh, that the both the fatalities and the financial losses, economic losses from the fire would be as large as from the earthquake itself. And in fact, we at first rejected it. It just seemed too extreme. And we compiled a, a panel of fire chiefs to really talk it through. And they concluded, if anything, we'd underestimated it. So. In the shakeout model, we estimate 1,600 fires will be started large enough to need to call a fire engine. 1,200 would ex uh, exceed the demand of the one fire engine that could respond. And we don't have that many fire engines in Southern California. So some of them are really going to be getting out of control. And it's a terribly frightening picture. And we specified in that model that there would be no Santa Ana winds when it happened. And I wish we could make sure to specify that for the real earthquake, but of course we can't. It definitely seems like it's not just one disaster, it's several disasters at once because Jacob has reported on how an earthquake could even lead to wildfires. So then you're fighting several fires at once. And part of what I learned researching the San Francisco earthquake from back in 1906 is that the fire fighters had trouble getting to the structures that were on fire because the streets and the roads were blocked by debris of other buildings that had fallen. Could the situation get that bad? Yeah, and think about it. We won't have electricity, so there won't be any traffic lights. So the traffic is gonna have gotten um, gridlocked. That depends really a lot on the time of day at which the earthquake happens. But right, there will be fires. They won't be able to get to it. We'll have landslides in the mountains. You know, the flip side, if we don't, you know, maybe if we're in a rainy season, we'll have fewer fires, but then we'll have massive landslides that'll go with it. So a lot of where the fires would be getting out of control might be places where the roads are also landslided. There's a lot of ways in which it could compound in that way. And I guess I'd think about the 2011 Great East Japan earthquake that was such a disaster for that country. The earthquake itself didn't do that much damage. The tsunami did more but they probably could have recovered from that. It was sort of the compounded problem that the tsunami, that the earthquake knocked out the electric system and the tsunami washed away the backup fuel supply for the backup power that led to the nuclear collapse that led to the nationwide uh, suffering from, from lack of electricity. So it's those cascading failures. And we don't sort of by definition, we don't know which one, which combination we're going to be hitting but uh, think of our 71 San Fernando earthquake where we came so close to losing a dam that would have inundated the houses of something like 80,000 people. Um, and it was, you know, a big aftershock would have taken it out. We luckily had relatively small ones. We don't, you know, um, we aren't sure which one of those it's gonna be, but um, all of those are possibilities for the big earthquake. You mentioned those houses that were at risk. And the other part that I found really surprising about this is just how many people could end up homeless as a result of a large earthquake. Uh, yeah, Ron, a quarter million households is our estimate of people who will have lost their housing from the earthquake. Quarter, uh, quarter million. Uh, Ron, my next question is for you. And because it's my first time talking to you in this whole event, I'm going to slip in that I am glad you are here. And I'm a big fan of your reporting at the Times' Unshaken Guide. Thanks. Glad to be here. The world is so much more connected than it was during the Northridge quake. Uh, not a lot of people have landlines anymore. After a major quake, many of the electronics that we depend on, though, are going to be pretty useless. I imagine, what can we expect? Yeah, I mean, imagine, I mean, we haven't had a major catastrophic earthquake in California in the world of smartphones, um, you know, Twitter, uh, you know, most people's use of the internet. So one, one thing to think about and to really imagine about is expecting cell phone service to go down. Um, Lucy already talked about how we may not have power 
um, after you know a big earthquake. And so one of the things that you know Lucy has talked about is how there's only so many hours of, of ba backup battery in um, in the cell phone towers, and then once that's gone, we're out until the until the power comes back. Um, and this can have you know big consequences. So for one, um, you know. Practically speaking, you'll want to have a plan to, uh, you know, try to send text messages out. You know, try to use text messages if there's a uh, slim uh, cell phone signal to to loved ones. Think of a plan. You know, try to write down if your cell phone battery runs out. You know, try to write down uh, some numbers so that you can contact loved ones. And then also, um, you know, think about what it really could be like when you don't have cell phone service for a long time. One of the, the things that we saw in Japan was that there was the widespread power outages uh, in the hardest hit areas, and the cell phone service was out for a very long time. And at, at a certain point, people gave up and they left. Um, and so one of the things that would be you know, helpful is, is, is restoring that electrical uh, service uh, and the and telecommunication service, you know, sooner than later. But you know, one thing that is very clear is, is to expect a, a long outage uh, for a while. I, I w can I take that to advocate that people all Please. get radios uh, in those moments so that we can also broadcast over the air and let people know what's going on. Mm -hmm. That would be really important. Now, part of my understanding, I used to work at KFWB, a old news station here in Los Angeles, is that. Uh, after the Northridge quake, many people got into their cars so that they could listen to the radio so that they could understand what was going on there. Uh, Ron, one more quick question for you, because you are based near San Francisco, where, as I mentioned earlier, there was that devastating earthquake back in 1906, where more than 3,000 people are believed to have been killed and more than 80% of the city was destroyed. It got me to thinking big picture because earthquakes can change the look of a region, but I imagine it also changed the people, and maybe even the culture there forever. Do you think a major earthquake here would do the same to Angelinas? Yeah. I mean, you know, even in the, just the 94 Northridge earthquake, I mean, think about downtown. And if you walk around, you'll see these parking lots randomly. Those used to be Many, in many cases, those used to be brick buildings that were suddenly, you know, needed to come down, at, or you know, that either came down or needed to be condemned, um, you know, following that earthquake. One of the things, uh, you know, um, a couple of years ago, I went out to New Zealand, uh, which underwent a on the South Island underwent a, a big earthquake in the city of Christchurch. It's the it's the nation's third largest city, and they, they underwent a big earthquake in 2011. And one of the things that uh, was a big kind of tragedy of it was that eight years after that earthquake, large sections of the city had not recovered. And you know there was the Christchurch Cathedral where the front was still uh, in ruins and, and the, the tops were, uh, were uh, uh, pigeon roosts. Um, you know, and big projects intended to get the city back in service, you know, for example, a, a recreation center or a convention center, they still weren't done. And so one of the things that would be, you know, super helpful is for city officials, you know, really to think about what LA is going to look like after an earthquake and how you're going to resolve it. I mean, in downtown right now, there are still a lot of, even though there's a, a law now requiring brittle concrete buildings to be retrofitted, most haven't been. So if an earthquake happened right now, what is the city's plan to kind of figure out which buildings, what are you going to do when, when you know, wide swaths of older buildings in downtown need to come down? Can you create a system, a, a way of reimagining a city quickly so you can get the, the city uh, back up and running? One of the things that LA did really well after the 94 Northridge earthquake was getting those freeways up and running uh, quickly. They, they're the lifeblood of the region. But uh, something that happened in San Francisco, um, it took such a long time, you know, perhaps a decade or more to recover from the 1989 Loma Prieta earthquake. Um, there was a lot of, it took a long time for the city, for the cities up in the Bay Area to kind of figure out what they wanted um, the, the, the post Loma Prieta uh, Bay Area to look like. And that, you know, it, it took maybe about 10 years before the scars of that earthquake finally started to fade away. Well, so whatever recovery process 
you'd imagine after a big one here. Obviously, it will take years, but sometimes over a decade, you think. Yeah, and, and sometimes even more than that. I mean, in a really big one, we just really haven't had, I mean, if you think about uh, the history of California earthquakes, there's only been one earthquake that has killed thousands of people. We've been very fortunate. The, 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 the deadliest earthquake to hit Southern California was way back in 1933, the, the Long Beach earthquake, where we, where we you know, found out that earthquakes really do hit Southern California pretty hard. Um, and so, you know, it's it, it's something to to really, you know, imagine that, like, you know, we'll we'll need to kind of figure out uh, uh, a path forward to figure out what we want out of a post quake uh, reality. And hopefully, it's a it's a situation where city officials, the the public, can kind of come together and really work out a, a, a combined a unified vision for what can happen. Uh, in some cases, there can be situations where there's a lot of infighting um, and such, where it may take a generation or more. Something that Lucy has mentioned is that you know the 1906 that the San Francisco never really recovered from um, the 1906 earthquake that um, that population fell, and you could argue that it only really recovered in the dot com boom just a few decades ago. Um, you know, and that came as as LA started to 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 rise. And you know, if you look at places like uh, New Orleans and Hurricane Katrina, you could argue that 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 area has not recovered from such a disaster. So something to really think about, you know, as as cities look forward to figuring out, is it really worth it to try to imagine a time and imagine, is it worth it of investing a lot of money to 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 do retrofits and everything? It's really about investing in your own economic future. Do you want this to be a place where your children will be able to thrive, you know, 25, 50 years from now? Or is it going to be a place that is so problematic that people are going to leave? Wow. Well, now that we have some sense of how bad things can get, let's talk about how we can all prepare. And for that, let's go back to Pat Morrison. Thank you, Austin. And, and as Ron was alluding, really, if you look at the history of California, after the 1906 quake in San Francisco, the economic balance shifted to Southern California. The population shifted to Southern California. The growth, some of the political power shifted, all as a consequence of the fact that while San Francisco was trying to rebuild, LA had the opportunity to build and to expand. So the consequences go way beyond your neighborhood, way beyond even your city. So what can you do in your own house, in your own neighborhood, with your kids' school, any of the places that you think of as kind of an extension of your home to be prepared for the consequences and to be prepared not only for the moment of the earthquake itself, but as Lucy Jones was alluding, the real consequences afterwards where some of the true devastation may come along. So let's let's go back to Ron and talk about that alert system we were talking about and what what that can actually do in a practical sense, what it gives you time to do, and what you need to have done to prepare even to be alerted in the first place. So the one thing everyone should do if they haven't done it already is if you have a smartphone, download uh, the Earthquake Early Warning app. There are two apps available. One's called MyShake. It's, it's uh, built by UC Berkeley. And the other one's called Quake Alert USA. And, the, and they're free. Um, all it requires is, is you downloading it and giving access to, uh, for it to find your location. And it, what's great about it is that um, I, I had a, the, an experience recently where uh, there was an earthquake alert. It was not, it was a false alert, but it was still pretty cool because it, I got an alert on my, on my watch, my Apple watch. Um, so it was neat to be able to see that. And the, 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 the key thing is that once you get that alert, um, you know, you want to take action right away. It might be just a few seconds or maybe even longer, but to just drop cover and hold on. Um, and, you know, there are so many things that it, it really could save your life. You know, if, if, you're, if you're underneath your desk, that might get you protected from having the bookcase that you haven't strapped down from falling all over you. Um, there are so many things that, that, that can really help. I, one of the downsides to the earthquake early warning system is that it's just not well integrated in everything. So if you have an Android phone, for example, Google has built the earthquake early warning system in it, so you'll get the alert. But if you have an Apple phone, an iOS phone, it's not integrated in there. So you have to take your own action to download that app, so you'll get that warning. So preparation comes at every level. In 2008, the actress Helen Hunt, who won an Oscar, said, 
She learned to keep her Oscar on her shelf above her desk. So if there's another earthquake in California, I'll be killed by my own Academy Award. She's thinking of her obituary <laughs> and the SN that far ahead. But but Lucy, one of the things that, that comes up again and again, I know we'll get a question about it so we can deal with it now, is what you do during the quake. So many people think, oh, you go stand in a doorway. That's the thing to do, which is a myth that's more than 100 years old. It came out of the Red Cross seeing an old adobe building that had collapsed and just the door frame was standing. And they said, that must be a good place to be. And they started talking about it. And it, you know, people wanted something to do, and it got taken off. Drop cover, hold on. We really do know that it's the, it's the safest thing to do. Uh, almost certainly, your house is not collapsing, but almost certainly, things are going to be thrown around your house. So being under a table, a sturdy table, helps protect you. Um, if it actually did collapse, we've seen a lot of places where we get uh, uh, void spaces where people can be protected. You don't want to try and run a long ways to get to a table. If you don't have one nearby, crouch by an interior wall, at least get away from windows, broken glass, and don't use glass covered pictures in your hallway because you have to go through there to get out. Um, but yeah, drop cover, hold on. We know it's the safest. It's not emotionally what we want to do. We want to get outside, but that's it's very difficult to run in a big earthquake. If it's big enough to hurt your house, you can't run in it. Uh, and Ron, we also in the Unshaken series talked about earthquake kits, and you know, there's sort of the Goldilocks, small, medium, large. There's all kinds of options you could build your house exclusively for earthquake preparation if that's what you chose to do. But most people will try to find a happy medium. Can you talk about where that happy medium is between sort of complete paranoia and just sort of hunkering down and getting ready but living your life? Yeah, so uh, one thing I would encourage everyone to, to go to latimes.com slash unshaken, and you can subscribe to our free six-week email newsletter. It's supposed to be a guide to just be like, hey, this is how you can reasonably figure out how to prepare in an earthquake. You know, you don't need to, like, do, you know, you don't have to go into, like, a, a hyperactive mode and start investing, you know, you know lots and lots of, of money and time just to do this. You know, very, very simple things can go a long, long way. You know, there, there's, there's ideas in there about, you know, figuring out how to turn off your gas if you have a gas leak. That's something all of us should know. A lot of us probably don't know how to do that. Um, you know, how do you secure your stuff? I mean, it took me ages to kind of figure out how to strap bookcases down. But once they're, they're strapped, you know, you just won't have to worry about bookcases coming down, coming down on you. And, and there's, there's information to you about, you know, how, you know, what kind of kit should you have? How much food do you want? How much water should you have on hand? Like, did you know that, you know, you'll want um, a gallon of water per day per person or per pet, you know, for perhaps 14 uh, days? I mean, that's a lot of water and you'll, you know, you'll want to cycle it out, you know, every so often, but that is, that can be, a key game changer between having a uh, a reasonably comfortable post quake experience to being very very uncomfortable. Okay, does wine count? <laughs> yes, and and you know make sure you figure out a way to keep your wine in an area where you won't lose all of that wine. Um, uh, you know when the shaking happens. Uh, and Jacob KPCC survival guide has some pointers as well. Yeah, absolutely. People can go over to las.com forward slash the big one. Um, you know, uh, one thing I would like to point out, you know, I mentioned people with uh, access and functional needs earlier, and that's something that really, when you're, when you're planning with your family and your friends nearby, um, first off, you should be doing that because they're more likely to help you than, say, emergency responders. But especially for people with access and functional needs, some sort of disability, if you have medicine, that you need to keep refrigerated. You need to figure out how you're going to do that. If you have a caretaker that needs to come and help you move or you have equipment that's reliant on electricity, there are some resources that can help you uh, hopefully kind of figure out what you would do if the power did go out. So we have uh, some of that stuff on laist.com forward slash the big one. Um, but there are an awful lot of considerations that, you know, for my family, we really think about how are we going to stay comfortable for two to three weeks. And that's what we have been working towards, plan, like working towards since we published the big one, since before we published the big one. So it's an ongoing thing that I know we're working on. 
And so if you feel bad uh, that you haven't completed and you have your perfect like earthquake setup going on, don't. Just get started today and you'll be in better shape than if you didn't. And, and Lucy, how psychologically as well as literally prepared are people in, where is their sweet spot between people who are in complete denial and people who may go overboard if there is such a thing? I, I see uh, both extremes. I, I think uh, I would give advice to people in managing it yourself. Know that you have a deep-seated need to rationalize, to, to find a way of feeling safe. You know, we've done it. We see people with the pandemic uh, believing it's no worse than the flu because at least then you feel safe or believing I'm just going to have to do everything I can and over obsessing about every way of never interacting with any other people. Both extremes make you feel safer. And we see both with the earthquakes. And so whatever you do, try to actually, you know, think it through and and the, the earthquake's inevitable. Absolutely. You don't get to say it's not going to happen. Okay. Now that we've accepted that it's going to happen, it's also not going to be bringing down every building around, right? <laughs> most of our buildings really are fine. And most of the people are really going to be fine. How do you find what's appropriate? And I, um, I think it's hard for people to understand how disruptive life after the earthquake is going to be. I think most people who live in California have accepted that earthquakes are part of it and how to manage it. Um, and I think we manage that moment better than we uh, are ready for the aftermath. So we've been talking for a while. So let's start hearing from you with your questions and your responses and your perceptions about what it is you've been hearing from us and your own choices about how you choose to live in earthquake country and to prepare for them. So let's bring in Samantha Melbourne Weaver. She's the Times Audience Engagement Director, and she has some of the results of what you're all saying and asking about this evening. Welcome to you, Sam. Thank you, Pat. Yes, we sent out some polls and we've been chatting with our audience members today. Um, so let's bring on the, the results to our first poll question. We asked, how prepared are you if a large earthquake hits tomorrow? Um, kind of scary, 55% of our audience said they don't feel prepared at all. Only 8% said they feel very prepared. Uh, I wonder, actually, Dr. Lucy Jones, what, what's your reaction to that? Does that track with what you've seen? Yeah, I mean, I would, you know, we can always think of other things we should have done. So if you're the type to be prepared, you still think about all the things you haven't done. A very prepared number doesn't surprise me a whole lot. I guess I thought a lot more people would be in somewhat prepared. This says to me that there's a lot of people who haven't dealt with it at all. And, and maybe that's because it's been a while since we've had a scary earthquake, at least, right? The, that 3.2 in El Segundo might have scared a few people right on top of it. But yeah, we need a few fives to wake people up so they'll be ready for the eight. And, and keep in mind, these are people who are watching us tonight. How many people are there out there who are not tuning in, choosing not to tune in, don't want to hear about it? Yeah, this is a good first step, definitely. Uh, we also asked, how do you, do you have an early earthquake warning app installed on your phone, the ones that Ron mentioned earlier. Uh, we had 28% said yes, and 72% said no. Ron, how do you respond to that? Yeah, that's, that's not something that, uh, we, w is, that is promising. And it just shows how, you know, maybe there should be more efforts out there to try to figure out, you know, can we, you know, get more advertising out there to get people to download the app? Is there a way to try to automatically integrate the you know, earthquake early warning system into the iOS app, um, you know, and there would, it, it should almost be a thing where we should know. I mean, one of the great things about people who live in the Midwest is that they know how to react when a tornado um, <laughs> alarm goes off. Um, I, I'm, I'm guessing, I actually don't know. Um, but, um, and one of the things that I'm, I'm worried about is that not enough people really know what the earthquake early warning system is. You know, I don't know, for example, is an earthquake early warning, will it be integrated with TV stations and radio broadcasts? Um, you know, are there systems in place that where, you know, earthquake early warning system would broadcast live on everyone's computer? Um, you know, there's still a lot of work that really needs to be done to really educate Californians about this, because one of the the funny things about California is that we actually have fewer, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but we actually have fewer big earthquakes 
compared to say Japan or Mexico. So we don't get that reminder uh, as often as uh, as people in other places have. That, that's right. Japan has about three times as many earthquakes as we do. So people feel it much more often. But you know, even there, of course, they got their early warning earlier. They had it before the 2011 uh, magnitude nine earthquake. But most people didn't have it on their phones. They had a million downloads of the app in the month after the earthquake. And my guess will be we'll see the same thing, that when we start getting shaken in a way that scares a lot of people, then we'll start seeing both more preparedness and, and more access to this. It would be great if we could do it without needing a bad earthquake to trigger it. Sam? Yeah, we also sent out kind of a pop quiz. Um, our audience responded to this question, what should you do when shaking begins? Uh, 45%, I think, got it right. Uh, they chose drop to the ground, get under sturdy furniture. 14% uh, said run outside. 34% said stand in a door frame. 8% are not sure. Hopefully, after watching, they are now sure. That is yeah. depressing. Give up on the door frame, please. That is depressing. That is <laughs> so there are entire all... state campaigns promoting to get under the drop cover and hold on. Is Maybe we should try to have like a drill about it or something. Yeah, I don't know. Maybe you should line it up once a year. I don't know. You know, I think if Dwayne The Rock Johnson did a lot of PSAs about this, <laughs> things would be very different. They did <laughs> drop cover and hold on in that movie, too. They did. They actually oh, did it. No. He did PSAs. <laughs> oh, dear. Oh, dear. So, well, Sam, what, what are people asking? What are they anxious to know about? Yeah, some of our, our audience members sent in a couple of questions. Um, we'll, we'll cycle through them pretty quickly. Uh, we, we had two that were pretty related. Um, they're about how to protect your loved ones. So Tamara asked us, my parents are elderly and have some mobility issues. How can I help them prepare? And then Joseph followed up with, I have a beautiful Spaniel, Spaniel Terrier mix. That is important to me as anyone in my family. What do I need to do for her? Both excellent questions. Who wants to take one of those and then the other? Make sure that you have dog food and water for the dog in your supplies. You know, you're not evacuating. You know, this is a no notice event. You're going to be in your house. And uh, uh, it's interesting. Dogs seem to accept shaking a lot more. Cats all disappear for the next two weeks. Um, so your dog's probably there to help take care of you after the earthquake as well. Um, Someone else want to pick up the parents? Yeah, um, I think I, Jacob touched on that. Well, I yeah, I would just say I would say for your parents, you know, it it depends on a lot of different factors. Like I don't know if they're on the second story, if they're in a tall apartment building. I mean, what you need to work on is who is going to potentially go get them after the shaking stops. Um, I don't know if you live with them or who is going to come help you potentially move them if the building is not safe. If the building is safe and you have all the proper supplies and whatnot then of course you can hunker down. And that, that is the good thing about quakes is that a lot of the time you can hunker down. Um, but in addition to that, like I mentioned, medicines, any other, uh, if, if they do have battery powered um, wheelchairs or, uh, you know, I don't know, breathing apparatus or anything like that, um, consider if you can getting a generator. Uh, hopefully that's gonna be a little difficult in an apartment, but especially if you're, but if you are in a house, uh, sorry, if I knew more about the specific circumstance, I'd give specific advice for that. But these are all different things that you should, you should imagine that an earthquake hit tomorrow and imagine what you're going to have to walk through for the next like two weeks. And that's going to be power outage, potentially water out, not be able to get to the grocery store for food necessarily. Um, and, you know, possibly having to provide some level of first aid to your parents as well. And if you walk through that in excruciating detail, I am I'm sure you will be able to figure something out. And Jacob, in, in do you know point, if many... Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Austin. I'm sorry. Uh, Jacob, do you know if many assisted living facilities have plans in place uh, for the elderly if they're taking care of them and an earthquake happens? I think that is a really good question that is worth exploring. Uh, Lucy or Ron, do you know? I, I mean, I believe they have to have some sort of contingency. Plan. There's a very limited amount that's really required. There is some. Um, I actually consider it a sign of a good assisted living facility if they've really thought it through and are trying to help them. Um, I, I have an aunt in assisted living and they have regular drills and they talk it through and they participate in the shakeout and all of that, I think it shows that it's a place that cares. I, I would, it is definitely 
put in a call to, an, if you have a family member in an assisted living facility, put in a call to them and ask. I mean, if you remember what happened, especially during some of the hurricanes down in Texas, people were all but abandoned. And so you should also have a contingency plan to hopefully go and or have someone go and, and help your family member, which, uh, you know, it, we, we need to do a better job supporting people, especially that obviously need the most help in this country. And, and we do a very bad job and people are always surprised by that. Can I, I'd like to make two points out of this. One is that if you call and ask the assisted living facility if they're doing it, that's going to make them think that this matters to people. Just that, you know, ask your landlord if he has earthquake insurance or ask, you know, or has he done the retrofitting? Ask the assisted living how they plan for this. All of that says this is something that matters to people. And I think that is really one of the more important things that we can do in, in you know, I think... I think there was a time, I would say that when I was growing up in Los Angeles, we all knew we had earthquakes, but you didn't talk about it because it was sort of admitting there was like a downside to California and we didn't want to say that. Uh, but if we admit it and really talk about it, um, that's how we're going to help each other. Uh, Samantha, some of the questions came in. Were people asking about that? Do you think people were rethinking their commitment to California? We did, yes. We did get one audience member, April, who who wrote in, is it insane that we live here considering these risks? Um, which I think is a fair question. I guess I would say you got, there's risks everywhere you live. You know, we don't have hurricanes here. I, I'd put wildfires, unrelenting climate change, uh, extreme drought, probably uh, up there with earthquakes as more of a compelling reason to, I don't know where you, you don't go anywhere to escape climate change, but I, I know Lucy, it, Lucy and I have talked a bit about this too. Um, I've reached the point that I can't advocate for earthquake safety if you don't deal with climate change, because what's coming from climate change will be worse. And, and one thing, oh. that it's everywhere. And one thing to remind, remind us though, is that the reason why California is such a great place to live, if you, if you think California is a great place to live, which I do, is, is that is earthquakes created our landscape. So the reason why Los Angeles, as, as Lucy has mentioned, is a place that is a, is, a, is a nice place to live and not like the Mojave Desert is because of those San Gabriel Mountains. And, and guess what has made those mountains? It's, it's earthquakes. It's, it's earthquakes that, that created the, the oil reserves that gave uh, LA its uh, economic boost early in its, in its, in its, in its career, in its, in its uh, historic time. Um, so the, the beautiful views, the fact that, 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 um, that uh, you know, the, 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 all the things that we enjoy about California probably all have to do with the fact that earthquakes are there. So it's, it's something that we can embrace. I mean, it, it's something that we should just embrace as, as just a fact of, of life. And how do we, as people who live here, you know, deal with that risk? And, you know, one thing to kind of keep in mind, too, I, I've, I've gotten emails from people who are really frightened about how you deal, you know, with an earthquake. And what I tell them is like, look, you are probably going to survive. You are probably going to live. I mean, if you, if you think that your first goal is to drive off, where are you going to go to? I mean, you're, you're going to be better off at home and you can do very simple things to, to make sure that things are going to be okay. If you live in a, in a, an older home in a forties home that um, where it, it, where it's a little bit off the ground, um, you know, call a contractor, you know, figure out if you need to get your, your house bolted to the foundation. You could, instead of, a, it could be a $3,000 bill this time, instead of a $500,000 bill once your, your house has slid off the foundation. Just something to really keep in mind is that, uh, is that uh, you are probably going to survive and that, you know, if we can do things like send a man to the moon, uh, send people to the moon, uh, surely we can engineer our ways to make sure that we're going to be as safe as possible when the earthquake happens. I'm glad and you said that it. because we, we did have someone write in and ask about foundation bolting. Uh, Kevin, so if you tuned in, Kevin, uh, yes, great idea. You, well, Money well spent, according to Ron. Yeah, and one of the things that you can do is go to earthquakebracebolt.com. I think that's it. <laughs> Braceandbolt.com. <laughs> yeah. And you know the the state has for many zip codes in California, the state is offering um, uh, or a, uh, an organization affiliated with the state is offering free money, free grants of of a few thousands of dollars to get 
homes uh, bolted uh, to the foundation. That is one of the things that can uh, keep uh, a family so much more financially whole uh, after an earthquake. I, I interviewed homeowners in Napa uh, where they, they found out, uh, unfortunately, that they lived, you know, right on top of an earthquake fault and their, and their, and their foundations broke. And, and they worked too. Uh, there were, there, I went to a home side by side, a home that had retrofitted its foundation and a home that didn't. And the, the retrofit worked and, and the people who didn't retrofit it, they were in um, a, 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 a lot of problems. Another thing to consider, it's a, do, do read some research on earthquake home insurance. If you're a homeowner, um, you know, the, there's, there's something called the California Earthquake Authority. Do a little research to see how much it might cost and whether it makes sense for you. Because again, I mean, you know, that mortgage is going to come due no matter if your home is, is there or not. And doing a little bit of research can kind of help you envision uh, your financial future, your family's financial future. Samantha, what else? Pursue. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Lucy. I just wanted to sort of put a bow on everything Ron's just said in that, in, and it's about the risks. We are inordinately afraid of dying in an earthquake, even though our freeways are far more dangerous. And in fact, you're far more likely to be murdered in California than to die in an earthquake. We are insufficiently afraid of being bankrupted by the earthquake. And everything that Ron just said is about how to protect yourself financially. And people commit suicide when they go bankrupt. Uh, it's as much a life safety issue as anything of directly being hit. Samantha, got anything else for us? Yeah, I've got a couple quick questions and then I've got a fun surprise. Um, people are wondering, especially Bill, thank you for writing this in Bill, where should we stash our earthquake provisions? I'm assuming that they should not be in the house, but outside the house in a secure container? I keep mine in that? my house because okay. uh, the chances of my house of coming down are very slight. Um, and this way I make sure they get refreshed. If you put them outside in the container, you've got a much bigger issue that they're probably going to be bad by the time you need them. And what you definitely don't want to do is put them in the garage somewhere where it's crowded out by other things and it's totally forgotten and you can't get to it after an earthquake happens. Uh, and our last question before our lightning round, uh, Christine asks, what should I consider when buying a house in an earthquake prone area? Do you have any tips for Christine? I, I've actually helped a couple of friends. Start with going to the California Geological Survey. They will show you your proximity to a major fault. I'm willing to live near faults. I can't live in Southern California without that. I do not live on top of a fault, right? You can find that information at CGS. Equally, you can look and see whether or not you are at risk from landslides. They call it earthquake hazards. It's one of the triggered hazards. Uh, and of course, there's plenty of other things that can bring down the, the hillsides. So uh, I'd say go look at those sites, keep away from those. Um, and if it's an older house, make sure it's been retrofitted or do it yourself when you buy it. Oh, Samantha, you talked about a lightning round. We've been talking about surprises all night. This better be a good one. <laughs> so we, we had a bunch of uh, audience members write in with some myths related questions, uh, writing in to see, I heard this from someone, is it true? So I thought we could run through a couple of them. We'll just an ask really quick, shout out your answer, offer a quick explanation. Um, we've got like five or six of these. So everyone get ready. Um, it's like a game show time. Um, so really quick, Sonia Gutierrez asks, is it true that it's recommended for people to go up a building and not down when an earthquake is happening? No, that's the advice during a tsunami. Vertical evacuation, they call it. That doesn't apply That's to That's a myth. <laughs> That's a myth. All right, next one. I live in a one-story condo with a heavy tile roof built in the 70s. Is it better to stay inside or outside during a quake? I think in any case, inside. it's better to be inside, right? Cover. Running outside puts you at risk of that roof falling off. Wherever uh, you run. are, just stay, stay where you are. Because if it's a big earthquake, you're not going to be able to move anyway. Um, Ron asks, a few years ago, I read an article claiming you're safest lying on the floor next to your bed. The bed allegedly deflects falling objects. I'm skeptical, but I will ask if there's any validity. One of the biggest cons out there called the triangle of life, and it's literally a con. Con. Not only is it a myth, it's a con. 
Um, Carrie says, I heard shortly after the Northridge earthquake that if we lived in the San Fernando Valley at the time, we had experienced our big one. Is that true? Everybody's going to experience a big one no matter where you live. We're California. Um, fault lines. How much does it matter where we live in relation to them? I think we just I mean, heard I don't that want my, my house bisected by one. Absolutely. Yeah. Don't Everybody. don't live on top of it. Being nearby, yeah. we all are. Uh, and then one last question, a fun one from from Kathy. Do you have advice for how to round up house cats before or after the big one? How to what after the round, round, round up your pets? How to round up your oh. pets? How to herd cats? A lot uh, on a horse. <laughs> Except your cat's going to disappear for a week or two. It'll come back eventually. There you go. Real advice. Thank you so much. That was my last question. It's been a pleasure. That was terrific, everybody. I want to thank Dr. Lucy Jones and, of course, Austin and Jacob and Ron and joining me, all the Times readers, the Times staff who helped to put this together and shared questions and expertise this evening. We don't want you to come out of this overwhelmed. We want you to feel empowered by what it is that we've been talking about. So sign up for Unshaken, the New Times newsletter to get you earthquake ready in six weeks. KPCC in LA has had the survival guide to help you through as well. Austin, you want to wrap some of this up too from uh, your point of view? I do. I too would like to thank all of our excellent guests who are in all likelihood saving lives, maybe even one of ours. I'm also honored to share this digital stage with Pat Morrison tonight because we actually worked together many years ago on Air Talk, and so it's been a joy to work with you again. Back to getting the old team together again. <laughs> Gangs back together. And I'll also give a special thanks to LA Times and LA readers as well as KPCC listeners because we bring you this vital information and hope you'll share it with your friends and neighbors so that we can make our region more resilient when the inevitable big one happens. For even more on how to prepare for an earthquake, because I know everyone here is an overachiever. I mean, you could be watching the Clippers right now, uh, but you can always head over to the las.com slash big one. If you go there, you'll find a survival guide as well as a link to Jacob's podcast by the same name. I redownloaded it this week, and it is perfect for all that post-pandemic traffic we are sitting in these days. So <laughs> thank you all again, so, and have a great night. And so everyone, we want you to get prepped. And while an earthquake may, may need leave you leave you stirred, it will leave you, we hope, unshaken. Good night, everybody.